Hey everybody, welcome to Colin podcasting about real estate. This is show 26. My guest today is Antoine Martel, who has built two out-of-state businesses, a fix and flip business selling 20 turnkey rentals to mostly Californian investors and a fast-growing 100-unit apartment portfolio within his family. And most impressively, Antoine is still in his mid-20s. He just got started in this journey less than five years ago. It's very impressive. And since then, his father, his mother, and his brother have all joined his team and they're working closely together to create intergenerational wealth while helping hundreds of investors to build passive income streams. So a very impressive young man. And during our conversation, we discussed how his entrepreneurial spirit manifested itself at a very young age, how he gave up trying to invest in LA and switched to Memphis instead and later to Ohio, how he used the Burr strategy for his first 10 deals, how he built a database of investors just by word of mouth and social media, how he managed to build teams of contractors and managers out of state with no mean feat, how he divides his time between income generation in the turnkey business and asset building in the apartment business, the challenges of running a family business. You know, he does work with his mother, his father, and his brother. Uh, talk about how he hopes to build a portfolio of 10,000 units. It's quite an ambitious goal. And his advice for people starting out and how to get through that first deal, first five deals, and, and much more besides. So really interesting chat. I think you're going to enjoy it. Seems like a super nice guy. And before we switch over to Antoine, just want to remind you as always uh, to check out my website, colininvestments.com, C-O-L-I-N investments.com. You'll find a range of reports. You'll find all the previous podcasts. You'll find the previous podcast videos, also some additional videos. You'll find links to schedule a conversation with me. It can be a 20 minute conversation. There's options for one hour conversations as well. I'm also in the process of setting up some foreclosure training. So if you want to hear more about that, just send me an email. You'll find those details on the website as well. So lots of good stuff happening. But let's, uh, that's enough about me. Let's move on over and check out what Antoine Martel has to tell us about his journey. Antoine Martel, how are you doing, buddy? Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. So I, I see you've achieved a, quite a bit of success in a short period of time in, in real estate, Antoine. Before we get to all the cool stuff you're doing now, can you bring us back to the very start of your entrepreneurial journey and tell us how it all started? Oh, man. Um, I guess we can go back really far. I mean, as a little kid growing up, I was, you know, I was the kid selling, uh, you know, picking fruits off my neighbor's trees and putting it in a wheelbarrow and wheelbarrowing it around to sell it, right? So I've been an entrepreneur and that was age seven or eight years old. So I, I was an entrepreneur since, uh, since the day I was born. Then after that, my mom opened up a retail store and I was working the cash register at eight or nine years old. And mm -hmm. so, and the story continues. Then my mom started a sauce company and I was in Whole Foods giving samples as a 13, 14 year old and helping her, you know, give samples of the product that my parents had created. So Brilliant. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. And then really, um, I fell in love with technology, you know, through high school, I started a mobile app and then in college was introduced to real estate. And then that's kind of when things went crazy. Uh, once I was introduced to, to real estate, I really got addicted to it. Um, what age were you when you were introduced to real estate? Is this when you're like 18, 19? Something I like was, that? yeah, I was 18 or 19 years old. I was introduced to it. My brother took me and my dad to the seminar in San Francisco, which in which we learned yeah. about flipping houses and kind of the behind the scenes of what the numbers are supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. And then from there, my dad had a full-time job, so he was really busy. He didn't really have the time during the day to study it or, you know, put in the work. My sure. brother got his real estate agent's license, became a real estate agent. So he kind of went down that path. And then myself, I was like, I was in college. I moved from San Francisco to LA to go to mm -hmm. university. Okay. And then I realized that uh, I didn't want to get a job after graduating from university. I wanted to really do my own thing. What did and you graduate in? What, what was your degree in? I studied entrepreneurship. Um, okay. So I went to a, a small private university here in, L in LA called mm -hmm. Loyola Marymount University. And then from there, the last, so I was there for two years and kind of those two years, I was really, <laughs> I was going to college and passing my classes, but I was really just focused on figuring out this real estate thing so mm -hmm. that I didn't have to go and apply for a job after graduating. I really wanted to do something in this real estate space. So what was and, your first deal? Can you remember it? Did you do it on your own? Did you partner with someone a little more experienced? 
Yeah. So what we did, I mean, it was a lot of trial. Like it took me two years of studying before getting that first deal. And it started really with like investing locally, which is kind of what everybody tells you. And then, so I started doing that, but when you live in California and you, uh, you don't have a million dollars in cash in the bank, which me or my family did not have, and you don't have any real estate investing experience or connections. We're not a real estate family or we weren't a real estate family. Mm -hmm. then it's, it's really difficult. So I started really networking a lot through bigger pockets and through other websites where you can network with people locally, mm -hmm. networked with people in LA who were investing in real estate and realized, you know, meeting with investor after investor after investor that a lot of these people were investing out of state. And I was sure. like, Oh my God, how are you investing out of state all the way from California? Started picking their brains. And then, so my first deal was in, was my last semester of university I bought a house. My dad, my, my dad had 40,000 bucks saved up that he wanted to invest. Okay. That was in the stock market or something like that. So we pulled that money out. We bought this house in Memphis for 35,000 bucks, renovated it for like five grand and then did a cash out refinance. And it was worth like 55,000 bucks after and pulled all the money out, gave my dad his money back or we got our money back before the before I graduated. And then I was kind of like nice. went to my dad and I was like, Hey, I can keep doing this after graduating. Just, uh, give me six months. Let me see if I can figure this thing out. Like I got a property manager, I have a contractor, I have an agent that's you know willing to help us. Mm -hmm. So let me keep going through this process. And so I graduated May, 2017. And then by like December of 2017. So the end of that year, we had like eight to 10 single family homes in Memphis as a family. Wow. And yeah. you're, you're still living in LA and your family's in, you know, Bay area as well. Yeah. So my family, my family recently moved to LA, but yeah, we're all in, we're all still in California, all still live here. And this and, wasn't uh, buying a turnkey rental and just getting someone to rent it out. You're actually buying a house, fixing it up, yep. doing a cash out rehire and, and keeping it. Were you, so you weren't, or were you flipping some as well? No, we weren't, we weren't flipping it at that point. It was really just like growing the family portfolio. That's and awesome. I was kind of just, just doing that with, you know, my dad worked full time and then would work another, you know, six hours with me after he was done with, with work to help me to help, you know, really jumpstart the family portfolio. So you and never so, really looked for deals in LA or did you have a kind of a, a, you know, six month period where you're just gave up and said, this is too expensive. I'm not buying in the ghetto. Exactly. The ghetto is too expensive. We, Exactly. Yeah. So we, we tried it. I tried it. We were submitting maybe like five or 10 offers a month for a number of months back to back. And it was just like every single time you would get a deal close, like somebody would come with cash and pay like 300,000 bucks over. And it was like, it wasn't just like one or two times. It was like every consistently people were like way overpaying. Like we would put their offer in our like num our spreadsheet to see if sure. we could buy the deal at that price and it's like we just couldn't compete it was an uncompetable thing they had like you know financing in house or they were buying all cash or they had like uh, an agent on their team so they were listing and buying it with that agent which was literally their profit um so i don't know it was yeah. we just couldn't couldn't compete with with no experience nobody you know, nobody on our team to be like an advantage and then no capital. It was like we were getting yeah. very expensive. And look, money. if you make a mistake in that price range, yeah. you're kind of out of the game. Whereas if you make oh, a yeah. mistake on a fifty thousand dollar deal and you lose ten percent instead of making ten percent, I mean you'll you'll dust yourself off and get over it. Exactly. Extremely low risk, and you have the rental too. So like here in LA, the or in California in general, the reason why I'm so scared of the market still to this day is. Because yeah, you, you mess up one little thing and there goes all your profit, but also like you only have one exit strategy, right? So like if you don't yeah. flip it and sell it, it makes absolutely no sense to hold it and rent it out as a, you know, you're, you're barely going to be, you maybe will make a hundred bucks a month if you get lucky, but there's no cash flow either in the, in the local market. It's so, a yeah. terrible cap rate. I agree. So how were you? Cause I mean, Memphis is, is far cheaper than LA, obviously in 2017 prices were, were a lot lower than they are now, but it's still a competitive market. You've Memphis oh, yeah. invest, you've a couple of big companies there that are buying and renovating property. So how did you, how did you compete? How did you find uh, your, your deals back then? So it was through a lot of MLS stuff, probably like 80% MLS and then 20% wholesalers. And okay. now it's kind of 50% MLS, maybe like 30% wholesalers. And then the rest is just like pocket listings from realtors. So wow. we're still able to find a ton amount of deals in the MLS and also just through like being in the market for so long. And it sounds like your first handful you mentioned, you spent 5,000 renovating it. That's a pretty light 
paint and carpet oh, yeah. type arena. Was that what you, you typically did or did you kind of progress up the ranks and start doing kitchens and bathrooms and floors and all the rest of it? That was really the first one or two. I really just wanted to get into something super light and just test yeah. the process, which is what I recommend everybody do when they get started. And then slowly over time, I mean, now our average renovation is probably like 20 to 30,000 bucks. So we're, we're doing spending significantly more money now on all the renovations that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, new kitchen, new bathroom, new flooring, new paint, interior, exterior, all that kind of stuff. So, so did you get lucky with your, your contractors early on or did you get burned dealing with a couple of, you know, bad contractors or, you know, useless people or how did that work out? Cause I know it's, it was a kind of tedious process for us to find the right crews. Yeah. Yeah. So finding the right crews was difficult at the beginning. Most of my crews came from, and still do today, um, from referrals. So referrals okay. are probably the biggest one. So either a referral from like a local agent or another investor or like a property management company, that's mm -hmm. been the main way that we've been able to find the contractors on our team. But yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, not just to get them on your team, but then to like manage those contractors, manage all the projects. So for every market we're in, which is Memphis and Cleveland, Ohio, we have a project manager person for every market. That's like managing all those crews that we have. Cause each market we have, you know, five to 10, crews that are working with us. Wow. So is that basically an employee, that project manager on a salary and, and some sort of incentive bonus as well? So they're on a commission basis. So for every property that we buy, they manage that project and they get a fee. So anything from like a 500 to a thousand bucks per project that they make to mm -hmm. manage those projects. And then, so it works when you're doing projects at scale, right? So we, you know, since back in 2017, we had those eight to 10 single family homes to kind of finish the story up. Yeah. Had those homes. People started reaching out to us like, Hey, how do we invest in Memphis or Cleveland or out of state? We live in California. We have some cash. We want to invest in, in rental properties. How do we get started? We said, Hey, well, we have these properties. We haven't refinanced yet. How about you buy that from us? We'll make a profit. You guys collect it and we'll connect you with our team on the ground. So that's how we started Martel turnkey, which is the turnkey company we have now. So we're in two markets, Memphis and Cleveland. We're doing like 10 houses a month per market right now and so wow. that's what we are like now and then because of that we're able to hire these project manager people who are managing all those projects for mm -hmm. us in those two markets so you're doing about 20 20 deals a month that you're, you're yep. selling to mostly californian investors that want to get those kind of higher cash flowing yep markets yep exactly that's brilliant and what's your own what's the family uh, portfolio looking like now so good question. So the family portfolio, all those single family houses have sold. The last one, the last one that hung on is selling is under contract right now. So somebody's going to buy that from us next month. Um, so we kind of started with the single families, started selling turnkeys, and then we, mm -hmm. we moved into the multifamily space in Memphis, Tennessee. So last year we bought about a hundred units of apartments in Memphis alone. Oh, wow. Um, and so that's kind of what the family portfolio has moved in. We bought a couple buildings with our own money and then we started, then deals just started pouring in once we started buying multifamily. And so with those deals that were pouring in, we started raising money and uh, kind of doing like joint ventures with people to partner up on those projects. So that's kind of how it's worked out now. So these, how, how big are those apartment buildings? Is it like one is 30 units, one is 50 units, or is it just two kind of large ones? What, what kind of? So there's five buildings, anything from like 11 units all the way up to 24 units. So like a couple 16 units, 20 unit, 24 unit and 11 unit. Okay. So what was your thought process where presumably you had a few dozen single family homes and you maybe had a meeting and decided, well, let's sell these and buy apartments instead. What was your, your thought process like and why did you decide to do it? So really the apartment buildings kind of fell on our lap. Um, uh -huh. The first one was a 20 unit building. It kind of was like in a really hot area in Memphis, Tennessee called Midtown. Okay. The deal was sent to us from a wholesaler that was selling me single families. He's like, Hey, you guys ever buy apartment buildings? And I'm like, no, but we'd love to. Um, we had some cash at that point. My parents had sold their house that they bought in the Bay area. Oh, right. like in okay. 2001 and they sold it in 2018 and you know, they bought it for less than a million. They sold it for over 2 million bucks. Um, and so that was a family home that we grew up in and we, we immigrated from Canada to the Bay area and we like bought this house for 700 grand, which we thought was ridiculous. And yeah. then a 
you know, <laughs> 20 years later, we sold it for over 2 million bucks, which we thought was even more ludicrous. And somebody went and tore down that house to build a new one. Oh, so, wow. Um, yeah. That's nuts. Absolutely. And did your insane. parents move to Memphis then or go? No. So they moved else? down here to Southern California. LA. Yep. Okay. And now they're, now they're renting here in LA. And so they took that capital from the from this house that they bought that we, the family house that we grew up in, mm -hmm. they sold that. And then with that capital, we, it, we had bought these apartment buildings in Memphis and then they use that cash flow to kind of live now, um, to rent in, in, uh, down here in LA. So that's, that's kind amazing. of how, so that deal like, kind of helped your parents almost yeah. retire early. Yeah, they well. So now my both my parents are working at Martel turnkey. So everybody's a family business now. My brother's in the business, both my parents. So, yeah, everybody's working in the company now. So that was that was a big move for them to be able to leave their full-time jobs. Because my dad was working full-time as a consultant for tech companies in the Bay Area. Okay. And my mom was working at Ritz-Carlton. So she was working in the hotel space. And so, yeah, through, we just hired my mom January of 2020. So she just started <laughs> this year. And then last, last year, my dad quit his job about halfway. So 2019. So. And they sold their house 2018. So 2018, then about a year later, once we got the apartment building squared away, my dad was able to quit. And then six months later, my mom was able to quit. So what's, what's that like a uh, family business where oh, the man. son is, is kind of the, the boss you giving your dad. Orders and, <laughs> uh, how does that work out? We're all, we're all kind of the boss. I mean, my dad, yeah, me and my dad work together very, very closely. That's for sure. Every single, I mean, we were just on the phone call right before this and we're going to be on mm -hmm. the phone call for three hours later after this. So he's, me and him work very closely together. And yeah, it was kind of, you know, I think that with me going right into the real estate space and not taking a full-time job was kind of, he was, he was kind of living vicariously through me because he, he's always had this full-time you know, nine to five job. And he's always yeah. wanted to do what I was doing. And so ever since growing up, he's been pushing that, you know, agenda on me, like, don't get into this rat race. Don't get into this rat race. Don't get into this yeah. rat race. And then uh, he even hooked me up with an internship when I was young, like 15, 16 years old, um, to kind of like prove it like, okay, you think you want this full time job or to join this thing? Like here, come sign up for an internship here. I'll I'll get you into this internship and come test it out. And yeah, I was there for six months and I was like, man, this is like, this is the worst thing ever. And it's so slow and blah, 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 blah. And so kind of, I think he's been kind of marinating me ever since I was a kid to yeah, kind of go like and it. do my own thing. Um, so what are your roles? What way do you divide up the roles between your dad, your brother, your mom, and anyone else you have? How do you, how do you do good. that? Yeah. Good question. So we have a sales team, which is uh, my mom and another woman, Angelica, who's uh -huh. been with me since the, the beginning. She's probably the, the first employee that we hired. Okay. And then my brother handles, um, w w it handles project management in Memphis, Tennessee. So he like about 30 days moved out there to kind of fix that project management thing. And then we have an acquisitions team, which right now is just one person. Um, and then my dad handles like the finance, uh, legal accounting, that kind of thing. Gotcha. And then I just kind of handle everything in between, I guess, like a COO role. Um, so I'm just kind of run all over the place everywhere. Gotcha. That's putting that up fires. Like a pretty awesome the, structure. The firefighter, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just kidding. That's what you the turn into. in the air, right? Exactly. Yep. So, so talk to us then I'm, I'm interested more in this transition to apartments. Talk to me about how, you know, finding and, and kind of funding those deals yeah. was different. Uh, from when you used to be accumulating single family homes. How did you, cause now you're moving into the millions of dollars and you're not just yeah. getting a 30 year Fannie Freddie loan, like other kind of yeah. small investors are. Yeah. So it is way different, right? So like all the single family homes we buy now buying 10, 20 houses a month, all of those houses are bought with cash, right? So super easy. I don't have to deal with no appraisal or inspections or anything like that. So it is very different moving into the apartment building space, especially if you don't have like a W2 and the deals you're buying are less than a million bucks. So I can't even go and get the traditional Freddie Mac financing, right? Um, Cause Freddie Mac has a loan minimum of a million dollars. So like the first couple of buildings we bought were like 500 grand and then like 900 grand. So there's this really like gray area of multifamily finance um, that's within that space. Mm -hmm. And so finding those lenders, building the relationship with those lenders, 
making sure they invest in, they lend in Memphis, Tennessee or out of state markets and then going through their approval process and stuff like that. The Not first, like I say it again. A lot of red tape, a lot of your oh, yeah. with those guys. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And also too, like a lot of just stress on us, like who we are, how much real estate investing we have done, what's our credit scores, what's our uh, net worth, because they have like net worth requirements, what's our W-2 or our income. And a lot of lenders want you to like personally, based on your W-2, to be able to cover the mortgage expense if, you know, X, Y, and Z. But for us, the way that we set up our company we were paying ourselves very little W-2 um, to avoid tax and do all that kind of stuff um, or avoid higher taxes. And so we were like, you know, paying ourselves very low W-2. So we went, would go apply to these loans where they had a W-2 requirement and like we couldn't even buy a $70,000 house uh, in Memphis with these lenders because we were paying ourselves such a little W-2. Um, so it, it definitely was a challenge. Eventually we found what's called like an asset based lender. Um, okay. So they really just gave us a loan based on the, that property. Um, mm -hmm. Sadly, due to COVID, a lot of those lenders have uh, disappeared because um, mm -hmm. they're not buying those anymore. So buying apartment buildings right now, really weird time. If you're buying properties, you know, from a hundred grand to like a million bucks, it's very difficult to get financing unless you have a good W2. Um, but um, like in Memphis, the thing is in, in the, a lot of these markets, Memphis, uh, Cleveland, anywhere in the Midwest or the, the Sun Belt, a lot of the properties that are like 10 to 40 units are going to be less than 1.2 million bucks. So sure. you're kind of in yeah. that weird range where um, you can't get Freddie Mac financing and you have to find this other weird kind of lender. Yeah. Now I can imagine that was a challenge and, and well done for, I, I, obviously you did get through some, you found those asset bait lenders in the end. So how, how was uh, COVID then for, for this? I mean, these apartment buildings, how did that affect these, you know, medium to low income tenants in the apartment buildings? How was it? Yeah. That? Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as you would think. Uh, we had a couple of evictions, but none of them were related to COVID. The okay. one biggest thing was that the court system was shut down for a number of months. So we kind of like, like had all these tenants that were like, like three or four tenants in one building, that we're not paying. And then it kind of just like snowballed to where then in one month we had like four people move out because the court finally opened and we were able to get them out. So that was yeah. kind of the only issue um, mm -hmm. with the other business, the turnkey business. I mean, there was a, we were really scared about uh, construction teams like, or them stopping yeah. construction or not allowing like a lot of people in a house. Thankfully in both of our markets, they, that was fine. And there was no like eviction moratorium until the federal moratorium came out. So we were mm -hmm. still able to get tenants out, still able to do construction. So things were just a little bit slower. Sure. Um, now the biggest thing is really waiting for like, we have like windows that we ordered, which are like six weeks out or um, wow. other special things that we have to order. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that's just holding up on just getting these items delivered. So that's the biggest holdup right now. But I yeah, think windows, kind of, lumber, appliances are a lot slower lumber. than they used to be as well. Yep, appliances. Oh my God, I had to change my appliance supplier like three or four times. And I'm just going back and forth with all the appliance guys because we'll we'll go and like, I'll go to Home Depot and order the same appliance like three or four times. And then they're like sold out and it's on back order. And I'm like, what? you only have three in stock, you know? So um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's the same here in Tampa. It's the same. It's the same. I mean, construction never stopped during COVID, but you noticed after a few months of it, that inventory yeah. at Home Depot for certain items was, was getting tricky and things that would arrive after three days or suddenly are yeah, taking yeah. three weeks. So it's, yeah, it's a pain in the ass for your, your holding costs, obviously. Yep, for sure. Um, so, so talk to us about your, your, your turnkey business. And you said it started out with sounds like, like, what like kind of friends or, or, or referrals comments you're saying I heard you guys bought 10 houses how do I get a piece of that how, how did exactly. that expand and obviously you're not just friends and family now if you're doing 20 a month yeah yeah so it started off friends and family and then a small little like email list of investors through that bigger pockets networking that I was doing through college so a couple hundred people there and then kind of just kind of just took our whole email list like as a family and just said like, Oh, here's all, here's all our friends and family's emails. And we kind of put that and I made a janky little website called Martel family realty and uh, just started like listing houses that we had under construction. And um, then from there, it was a lot of word of mouth, 
a lot of Instagram and a lot of net, me networking on bigger pockets. So I continued networking on bigger pockets. I started posting on Instagram about what, about what I was doing, which then created a lot of, you know, just telling the biggest thing was just like letting everybody that knew me, letting them know what I was up to um, gotcha. was a big thing that I think a lot of people are not doing, which I think helped me a ton because now everybody, you know, the 2000 people that knew me or whatever on Instagram now knew, Oh, okay. Antoine is, you know, graduated and now he's doing X, Y, and Z. And, um, I think that was super helpful because then all the kids that I had gone to high school with or middle school or college that all knew me growing up or whatever. Now they were in the workforce. Now they had their job. And so I would start to see that their bosses or their, you know, coworkers would then be referred to me from X, Y, and Z person. And that's how we started to also sell to, you know, people that we had never met before. And it started just word of mouth just happened from there just by posting on Instagram or posting online what we were up to. And so nowadays, how do, what do you, what do you typically do? Obviously you're active on, on social media, you're active yep. on bigger pockets. Do you, do you do other stuff as well to attract investors? What do you, what else do you so do? So we do Facebook, Instagram ads. Um, Instagram is a huge one, just like with my personal following on Instagram and posting and doing marketing through that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, he, word of mouth is still huge. Like word of mouth is probably like 60% of the deals we sell are still today from word of mouth or referrals. Um, and so we pay, we pay our clients or pay people for referrals, like $500 cash if they refer a client. So, um, we've gotten a lot of people that have just like, you know, they'll send us like five referrals in one day. And then they're like, Hey, hope one of these works out. Like if they do send me 500 bucks and we're like, absolutely. So yeah. tons of referrals still today and really just asking for the referrals. So we have like an email blast that goes off twice a week. Okay. And so at the bottom of that, we're like, Hey, refer somebody over to us and we'll pay you 500 bucks. So that's, that's still been working a ton. And also it helps like our salespeople a lot because a lot of the times the client who has, who is referring us has bought a property from us in the past. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like a personal recommendation. And they also do a lot of the educating part as well um, to kind of hold their hand throughout the real estate investing journey. So amazing. Cause I remember I first started uh, you know, marketing to investors back in 2006 and seven during the previous yeah. boom, if you, if you remember that, or you vaguely remember that. And obviously we didn't have any, any social media or anything like that. And so I had to do it the traditional way. You would literally take out little adverts in the newspaper or, or a magazine or, you know, stick up signposts and you would say, meet me in the Burlington hotel at 6 PM on Tuesday, the 15th. And I'll talk to you about wow. investing in real estate. And you would just hope 10 or 15 or 20 people would turn up. I mean, you didn't even have LinkedIn, you know, so obviously we had email blasts for people, yeah. that, but they were the email addresses for the people that came to meet you the last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. it was, it was a lot more organic. It was a lot slower and uh, it was a lot more old school. And just the way you can do it now, even without advertising is, is just amazing. Um, yeah. It's crazy. But yeah, no, just imagine I can lift up. It. Yeah. I can lift up my phone right now and, 2000 people are going to watch it within the next 24, you know, I can way more than, cause I used to like do bigger pockets. I would go message people personally and go like one-on-one -on -one meeting with people. And some of them were a huge waste of time. And some of them were, you know, a great investment of time, but it was like, I can't keep doing these one hour meetings with people for coffee or whatever, whatever. Cause it's way too risky. Now, if I'm going to spend an hour of my time and it's a big waste of time or it, it doesn't come to anything, then it was a huge loss, but now I can, you know, I can go on a bunch of phone calls or <laughs> go FaceTime with people online and it's, I can have 20 meetings in that one hour period instead of just having one, you know, it is. And, and another thing dealing with, I've, I've sold hundreds of properties to investors. A lot of them are, are in California and a lot of them are repeat buyers and are referring, you know, their cousins and all the rest of it. And, you know, if you sell a property on the MLS to just some retail person, you're once it's sold, you forget about it. It's gone. You never yep. have to worry about it again. But if you sell to an investor like a month or two or three months later, they'll often literally just forward you their emails from the property manager. Hey, I got yep. a bill for 200 bucks. I got a bill for a thousand bucks. What do you, what can you do? And I'd imagine you must get a lot of that as well, particularly yep. if they know you personally, because they're the friend of your cousin Jimmy yep. or whatever. How do you deal yeah. with that? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. We get a lot of those and, um, there's a very fine line 
like a lot of people, there's some people that ask too much. Like they, they sent yeah. us every little thing like, Hey, I paid 25. Like they bought a property six months ago. Hey, this $25 item is like, whatever, something you should have handled in the renovation. And I'm like, really? $25 you're coming, you know, emailing me about. And so there's certain things we do handle and certain things that, uh, we don't handle, we won't handle. If we think it's something that like our guys missed or that should have been handled during the construction process, then mm -hmm. we'll go back and we will pay for that item. There's a lot of, there's other times when, you know, we think that that, that issue may have occurred, you know, when the tenant moved in or because of sure. tenant damage or, or happened after, or it wasn't something that we knew about. And they, cause a lot of times our investors get inspectors, right? So we're like, Hey, mm -hmm. hire this inspector. You do your thing you tell us what you want fixed and we'll tell you if we'll fix it or not. And then we'll move on. But, um, a lot of the times, like if the inspector misses it, the appraiser misses it, or it's not heard about, then it's kind of like, Hey, we didn't know about it. None of the people you hired knew about it. So there's nothing that we can do. Um, so yeah, it's a really, it's a really great area. Um, like of course, if somebody buys a house and a week later, something explodes, like, okay, well we can handle that. Kind sure. Of thing, the microwave but, stops working after a month. I mean, yeah, you exactly exactly but there's yeah there's it's a very fine line and you're right like that's why i'm kind of envious of a lot of the big house flippers out there that uh sell these houses with agents and like they're, they sell it and they never have to think about that property again or never have to pull it up in the crm so it's uh yeah i'm pretty envious of those people yeah no I, i've i've done both i've transitioned a little bit to selling on the mls to the big corporate cash buyers which yep in a lot of ways is is more more straightforward. They have their inspection yeah. period. And after that, they're not going to come back to you after six months of a $800 plumbing bill. Cause it's, you know, yeah. just one of 5,000 houses. They, own. Exactly. they, don't, they don't care about me, yep. you know, but <laughs> both, both have their pros and cons. Selling to investors is, is very rewarding. You, you can get a lot of volume. You can put them under contract during the renovation. You can sell them a lot quicker and yep. less emotional than a retail buyer as well. So there's, there's a lot of great things about it. And, and, uh, those guys helped me become successful. And it sounds like they've helped you become very successful yep. as well. Um, yep. One thing I'm, I'm curious about you, that's a pretty big turnkey business you have now, you know, 20 a month and, and doesn't seem like you have a huge team uh, kind of running the show in, in the kind of HQ. So how do you, how much of your time do you spend on kind of the family portfolio building? Like the, you know, getting those apartments humming along and getting new ones versus the turnkey business. How do you, because they're two very totally different. Yep businesses you're running one is is to grow your wealth and one is to grow your your income how do you manage your time and, and priorities um turnkey business probably 90 percent of my time apartment buildings probably 10 percent of the time the apartment buildings don't really require much of my time it's pretty automated the way that i've set it up same contractor same scope of work for every unit we mm -hmm. buy the buildings all the renovations on the exterior are done and then we just wait for tenants to move out and I get a notification, I send out my contractor, he already knows what to do. So it's kind of automated, leasing is automated by property management. So that's kind of all handled, the the, temp, the the apartment building side of things. The turnkey business is really where I've spent a lot of my time. Yet it creates an income, but it also creates the cash that I can use to go and buy more apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the one caveat where if the turnkey business, I let it go to hell, then my apartment building portfolio would be hurting because that needs the cash from the business to keep investing, to keep turning those units over and over. Um, so so do you have a goal about how many apartments or how many doors or passive income you want to add, you know, every year that, that you're, you're kind of aiming towards? Yeah, we, I mean, my lifetime goal is 10,000 units. So oh. that's kind of what my, my lifetime goal is. Um, I just what, think, what are you up to now? Did you say you're in the low, low hundreds? Yeah. Low hundred, right, right below a hundred, I think 90 something units. So, so right Fantastic. at a hundred. Yeah. It's amazing. Right from a, a three year standing start. That's, that's very impressive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And that's, uh, I don't know, but I think I'm also thinking too small. So that's the way that I'm going to get to the 10,000 units is really going to be through. And I don't want to like 10,000 units where I own like 1% of the deals. Like I would like to own a significant, portion of those deals as well. So mm -hmm. the, I think the only way to get up to that is by buying larger properties. I'm, I'm never going to get there if I keep buying 20 or 10 unit buildings, right? Um, too mm -hmm. much management burden and it would just take way too much of my time because the same amount of time to buy a 20 unit, it could, I could buy a 250 unit. Yeah. So really focusing on, uh, and those buildings take a crap load of cash too. So 
it's it's going to take a while because the thing that makes me the cash is the turnkey business. Yep. The apartment buildings are kind of a slow drip. I can't really use like, okay, I make 5,000 bucks a month, but like it's going to take me 10 or 20 years to save up enough money to buy the next one. Right. So mm-hmm. the one that's creating the cash is the turnkey business. And so my goal is really to just maximize that business. Cause then I'll have the cash to be able to go and buy the larger apartment buildings, which will help me get to that 10,000 um, unit goal in a, in a very, uh, well, it's going to take a long time, but in a 10 year or 10, 20 year period to get to that kind of unit count. Um, I guess it's that whole 10 X rule. I mean, getting, even getting to 10 houses from one takes a big effort. Yeah. And, but then getting from 10 to a hundred is roughly the same effort and getting from a hundred yeah. to a thousand is about the same effort as it took. And yeah. once you get to a thousand doors, you look back at how much effort it took to get to a thousand doors. It'll probably take less effort to get the next 9,000 doors. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. But 100%. you're busting your busting your ass the whole way through it. I mean, yeah, <laughs> okay, I know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing is too, like I'm sitting here thinking, okay, I have a hundred units. That's great. And it was five buildings and it took a lot of effort, right? Like a year and a half or a year and a half. Yeah. A year and a half of, of, of effort, consistent effort to get those buildings. But really mm-hmm. if I had the money, if I had a million bucks in cash, you know, extra in the bank, I can go and buy a hundred unit building and, you know, in three months and then, you know, like it saved me a year and yeah, a half. You've, you've doubled what you did in a year and a half in, in two exactly. three months. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the key is getting the cash because that's really the jet fuel to be able to buy those larger buildings. And so that's really what I'm focused on, maximizing the turnkey business to create the most amount of capital to then go and buy large buildings back to back to back because I'll have the cash coming in from the business to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. And what's the the kind of you know, 10,000 units obviously makes you a very wealthy person, wealthy family, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of options. I mean, what's, yeah. what's the reason? I mean, is it that you want to retire at, at 40 and travel the world or you just love real estate and love growing and meeting all the people that you meet at the different levels as you move up the ladder? What, what is it? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess it's just a, a, a number that intrigues me that I think is uh, a, a reach, but also possible. So I think it's mm-hmm. a good goal to kind of strive for. And a lot of the big investors you hear about, like they're right around that number too. I mean, the, the big boys who are big syndicators or big investors, it's right around 10,000 doors. That is kind of that, that threshold. Uh, there's not many yeah. people with like 40,000 doors, right? So um, mm-hmm. I think 10,000 is kind of a good number to get me into that top 1% of multifamily owners that are people or families and not, you know, big hedge funds. Um, yep. So that, that's kind of why I came up with that number. And it's not really about the money or anything like that. I think just that having that number of doors guarantees generational wealth for ever, um, mm-hmm. as long as that's put into some family trust or something like that to protect it. But, um, so yeah. that's kind of what the, what the goal is, the generational wealth, the legacy and all those kinds of things. That's awesome. That's amazing. So let's let's start winding down now because you're a busy guy and you probably got some apartments to underwrite. So what <laughs> what advice would you give listeners who are just starting out? Because you went from one to twenty to fifty to a hundred in a few years, and it looks like you're going to be at two and three hundred, you know, pretty soon as well. What advice do you give people that are starting out that might not have as ambitious goals as that, but they're yeah. still nervous about buying the first couple? What what advice do you have? Man, it's uh the biggest piece of advice that I can come up with would be to just get started. And uh, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are trying to, you know, put a, put a circle into a square. And what I mean by that is they're, they have, they have all these resources and they're not matching up their resources to the best like strategy that makes the most amount of sense for them. So like I meet a lot of people or I met a lot of people on bigger pockets that, you know, have, have 20,000 bucks in the bank, full-time mm-hmm. job, two kids, two dogs, two birds. And they're trying to like do a ground up construction project in LA. And I'm like, dude, you're never, it's never going to happen. You're trying to, you're trying to do something that's going to take you 10 or 20, you know, you're going to give up and in six months, if you try to go down this path. So why don't you do something that like works within your budget, you can get started. You don't have to do this forever, but you know, just get in the game. And then from that, you're going to learn these things about investing in this way, but at least just get in the game. I just, I really, uh, I really think that that's the biggest thing is just look at your resources and then how does that match up with the investment strategy? And that doesn't need to be something, you know, I, what my goal was always to have a large apartment building portfolio. And my first investment was buying a $35,000 
crappy little house in Memphis, Tennessee, right? So yep. there's no, I didn't like, oh, okay, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to buy 4,000 of these and then I'm going to sell it and buy apartments. Like I didn't have any, I knew what point A was and I knew what point B was and I had no clue how to connect the dots, but I knew that yep. at least I had to get into the game to figure it out more. There's only so much studying and research you can do. You really just have to make that first investment and that's going to propel you to your end goal. I think that's it. I completely agree. I mean, you, you think of yourself at the bottom of a ladder and you might want to get to the top of the ladder, but you only really need to figure out how to get on the first rung. Yep. And once you get there, you figure out the second rung. Don't be worrying about how do I get in the third exactly. and fourth rung. It's not important. And I agree that starting with a, a kind of something achievable, like a light lift, something you can get a notch on your belt, just do a house. Yep. With, like, like what you did. You bought a house that just needed $5,000 in, in renovations and then you sold it and you, you moved on. You didn't I, I see people on bigger pockets, another one saying, I'm looking at this occupied foreclosure sinkhole property for my first deal. What do you think? Yeah. And it's a hundred yeah. years old. I mean, I think that's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pick, pick something else. I know. Well, yeah. Like imagine I'm sitting here right now. I have a hundred units. My goal is 10,000. I have no mm -hmm. clue how I'm going to, you know, unless I have uh, somebody send me a wire for 50 million bucks, I have no idea how I'm going to get that money or how I'm going to get there. I'm just taking it one step at a time and figuring it out. Um, and still today I'm here doing 10, 20 houses a month. I still have no clue how I'm going to get to 10,000, but, but that's my goal. So. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, yeah, we we'll keep an eye on your journey for sure. I'm sure you'll, you'll <laughs> tell people about it on social media. How about yep. reading, uh, Antoine, do you read a lot of books, any current books you're reading that you, you think, listeners could benefit from the last book i read was um sell it like sirhant by ryan sirhant uh that's probably a really good book to read if you have sales or have a sales team and mm -hmm. um that's a book i don't hear a lot of people mention so that's a really good book that i recommend okay i will i'll check it out stick it on yeah. the show notes and so this is a lot of fun antoine really enjoyed this conversation where should our listeners go if they want to find out more about you and, and follow you on your journey yeah. So the best place to reach out to me would probably be Instagram at Martel Antoine. Um, I also have a, my own book. If you guys want to read my book and learn about my story, you can go to free.martelantoine.com to get a free book. Um, and then if you're interested in turnkey rentals or investing in real estate with us, martelturnkey.com. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. I will put all those in the show notes, Antoine. And thanks again for sharing your story. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. There you go, folks. That was show 26 with Antoine Martel. I thought that was a really interesting conversation, really interesting guy. He's achieved a lot in a short space of time. I've had multiple podcasts now with, with young people in their mid to late 20s that have achieved an incredible amount in a short period of time. Uh, we had Ryan Shaw, we had Reed Goosens, and now we have uh, Antoine Martel and I'm doing one or two others as well. So there's a lot of young guys really killing it out there, you know, post COVID, pre COVID, during COVID, whatever you might think of it. So don't let age get in your way of, of being successful in real estate. It's never too young to start and it's never too old to start either. So just like, like he said at the end of it, don't be scared about how you're going to get your third rental or your fifth rental. Just get the first one, get on that first step on the ladder and literally just take it from there. It's, it's often enough just to know that real estate can be a life changing business, that building passive income streams can give you that financial freedom. You don't need to know every single step in the journey in advance. You just need to know the rough direction you want to take. And then it's, it's one step at a time and learning as you go along and accumulating the knowledge of how to do it by doing it in the first place. You, you can't plan out every single step and, and, and account for everything that might go wrong. It doesn't doesn't work like that and it is all about the journey and what you learn along the way and who you meet along the way and what knowledge you accumulate and, and how you use that knowledge to make your own life better and, and the lives of those around you better as well ideally so i hope that gave you a little bit of, of motivation to to keep going uh, and might maybe perked you up if you've had a couple of bad weeks with with your job with your work with some investments that didn't pan out just keep at it keep firing in the offers you know keep getting through those bumps in the road just keep keep going get out the other side it's a great time to get started in real estate and don't forget to check out my website colininvestments.com you find reports you'll find podcasts you find ways of reaching out to me ways of scheduling a call with me happy to talk about lots of stuff and how to help you in your journey i'll do it if i can i'm also starting some foreclosure training so reach out to me directly by email if you want to hear more about that and do give this a rating or a review if you are enjoying these shows i really appreciate that or better still 
uh, share a link to it uh, on your social media if you want to get the word out and help me get the word out I'd appreciate that too and yeah really enjoying this a lot of good guests recently and I've got a bunch more lined up so thanks again for tuning in but that's it from me today this is Colin G Murphy signing out and I look forward to catching up again soon with show number 27 all right bye bye Thank you.